going to welcome Sean from IOW. Local 34. Come on up. Thank you, Sean. Good Sorry. evening, everybody. It's kind of weird to stand down here with this podium. Uh, usually, when we have our membership meetings, I'm standing up here with it. So, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, super proud and happy to have you here. Uh, I walked off and left my notes inside my office, um, so I'm going to have to do this extemporaneously. Um, this hall is uh, dedicated to Jack W. Hall and James R. Herman. Uh, Jack W. Hall was uh, one of the senior organizers and ultimately international vice president um, with the ILWU. He was absolutely pivotal with the organizing in Hawaii and a friend of Jimmy's. Um, and when he passed suddenly in 1971, um, this, this hall was uh, finished being built. And Jimmy at the time was president of Local 34. And so they uh, gave the memorial to the both of them for the hiring hall. So very proud uh, of, of this building. You guys probably didn't notice, but we were doing dispatch quietly in the background. Um, it's all done. Um, so uh, I will tell you a, a short story, a fantastic story, uh, about my experiences with the Labor Archives. Um, I had the opportunity to have to take on the employers in their arbitration and it was a, based on a very, very old subject. Um, and the Labor Archives had Cagle's documents, including the transcript for a very important arbitration for us. Um, it was a 1960 award, which is seminal for clerks on the West Coast. And uh, I, I just happened to talk to our, inter, our secretary treasurer, who knows Catherine, and uh, they touched base and they said, well, you should, you should talk to Catherine. And I went up and Catherine provided me all kinds of fantastic information. But one of the things that she had was the transcript. And when I went to the arbitration, I hadn't intended to use the arbitration as an exhibit. Uh, it was just for my own education. And then the employer started to just say things that weren't true, things that did not happen at the arbitration. To recess it very quickly because I had the transcript with me. Made a copy of the pages that were pertinent and put it in. I said, Well, they don't know what they're talking about. They're completely wrong. Here's what this person said during the uh, arbitration. Well, where did you get that shot? Sorry, I can't tell you my secrets. <laughs> I'm not, not going to tell you where, where labor stores all of its fantastic information. Um, they said, Well, can you give us a copy? Absolutely not. <laughs> so, um, just, you know, I, I will tell you from personal experience, uh, I've been rewarded with the, all the things the Labor Archives have done uh, for the years, and I'm just super proud to have you guys here. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sean. And greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and welcome to the 37th annual program for the Labor Archives. I'm Tanya Hollis. You might not recognize me. I'm the new interim director of LARC, taking over for Catherine Powell. It's been a long time since we've gathered together to celebrate, and I'm so glad to see all your faces even if they have masks on them. Our guest speaker tonight has literally been with LARC since the very, very beginning. Um, as a founding member of our advisory committee, we owe Bob Cherney our profound thanks for all of his support over the years. We all the to make LARC a reality. Um, we truly owe you everything for, for our existence. We're also beyond excited to come together to celebrate your biography of Harry Bridges, something that uh, you yourself say has been in the works for many years, and to announce that Bob has donated his collection of research materials to LARC, uh, something we're very proud to have. Bob will be introduced this evening by Robbie Bridges. In addition to our guest speaker, we will take a peek in the stacks of the ILWU with Robin Walker, 
And then we're going to hear The Ballad of Harry Ridges by Marie Schell, accompanied by her friend Tony Marcus. It's always great to start a celebration by giving thanks. The Labor Archives is a well-oiled machine thanks to the hard work of our staff. Donations from individuals and unions have made it possible for us to continue to have Wendy Welker on staff as a part-time processing archivist. And we're very excited that we received a generous gift from the Anderson Family Trust, which has allowed us to hire Leah Silva full-time as a digital archivist for two-year digitization project. She's going to be digitizing uh, materials from the Henry Anderson papers related to agricultural workers in California. I'm also pleased to announce that thanks to a gift from our speaker, Bob Cherney, we have hired our first paid intern. I know the Labor Archives, I'm embarrassed to say, this is our first. But we do have um, a new intern named Devin and Nikki Hen Watchmore, who is nearing completion of his archives program at Simmons. We also get a great deal of support from our colleagues in the Special Collections Department of the J. Paul Letter Library. I'm very pleased and grateful that Eva Martinez is here tonight. And we also are grateful for Luca Thatchen, Alex Post, and our volunteer Angie Lynn Mendoza. So I'd like to now take a moment to thank our generous donors who have made contributions of $1,000 or more to the Labor Archives Annual Appeal this year. The Anderson Family Trust, IBEW Local 6, and I should say that Local 6 also gave funds to help support the digitization of the Labor Clarion. The Bay Area Typographical Retirees Club, IBEW Local 302, International Longshore and Warehouse Union, and Robert Turney and Matthew Lawler. For those of you that didn't have time to contribute, we're always taking donations through our website. Lastly, I want to extend my warmest thanks to Catherine Powell for the tremendous work she did to design the program that you all had on your chairs tonight, and to Leah Silva, who helped with all the setup for this evening. I could not have done it truly this year without both of you. So it's now, now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and fellow archivist, Robin Walker. Robin, all of you know Robin. <laughs> Robin is the Director of Educational Services, Librarian and Archivist for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Robin will share with us some of the, what the ILWU collections hold. I'm trying to get my timer together so I don't go over time. So I um, I want to thank the SFSU Labor Archives for asking me to speak tonight and putting together this wonderful show, uh, <laughs> this wonderful event on Harry Bridges and the ILWU. Uh, Tanya invited me to speak tonight to give a brief presentation on the ILWU Library, and I wanted to give you an overview of who we are. Um, what we have and talk a little bit about some of the people who've been stewards through the years of the ILWU's history. Uh, the library was established in 1943 by a vote of the ILWU International Convention. It was originally organized as part of the union's research department um, to support the union as it faced industrial changes made by World War II. Um, that included providing information and education on legislation, changes in the War Labor Board, and government regulations. This is a poster that I just uncovered a couple months ago in, the, in our records. Since its founding, the ILWU Library has been an important source of information for union officers and rank and file members to conduct union business, stay educated concerning the union's history and democratic process. The library is also, has always been since its founding, an important resource for community members and students of labor with an interest in the ILWU. Throughout the years, we've had many SF State students utilize our collections, including myself when I was a student at SF State. And Bob Cherney used our collections fairly extensively in the research for his book. 
The union's needs have changed over the years. This is a picture of our reading room. The union's needs have changed over the years, as has the role of the library. Uh, the librarian has always served an important educational role, but that role has expanded through the years. Um, as Tanya mentioned, I am the librarian archivist and also the director of education for the union. Um, and sometimes those roles, they might seem very different, but I like to think that they go hand in hand. That um, educating and developing union leaders also is um, important to keep the legacy of the um, progressive and, and, and militant unionism alive. This is another picture of our reading room. So although we don't collect books in the same way that we did in 1943, we still maintain a reading room and a small but solid collection. We have several hundred books. We have approximately 30,000 still images. We have hundreds of film and video recordings, plus art and memorabilia related to the ILWU. Some of the highlights in our collection we have the records for the California CIO Council. We have historical union newspapers from many unions, but just a few I'll mention. The International Fishermen and Allied Workers, the National Maritime Union, the Sailors Union of the Pacific, the Seafarers International Union, and the Coast Seamen's Union. We have the full papers of the Marine Cooks and Stewards and several others. Um, we also have records related to the March Inland, which was the ILWU's um, inland union organizing campaigns, including efforts to organize integrated locals in the Jim Crow era. Some of our memorabilia here. Um, we also have two historical traveling exhibits that we've put together through the years. One is on the 1934 strike and another is on the 1948 strike. That's actually a picture of our, um, our exhibit. And then also we have digital content available at our website, which is ILWU, um, sorry, archive.ilwu.org, and I'll put that up on a slide at the end. Um, with all that said, I'd like to think that a highlight of our collection is um, our collection of over 300 oral history interviews. We began collecting these in earnest in 1981 under a grant through the NEH, which produced 206 interviews with rank and file members from California, Oregon, and Hawaii. Since that project, one of the key people in that project, Hardy Schwartz, was made curator of our ILWU oral history collection, and he has collected over 100 additional interviews with people. These interviews focus, we do have um, leaders interview, but they focus on rank and file numbers. Harvey's written two books based on those interviews. On the right here is Solidarity Stories. He published that in 2009. Um, it's an oral history of the ILWU, and most recently, just a couple months ago, he has a book out, um, Labor Under Siege, which is about uh, Big Bob McElrath, who was uh, just the recent past president of ILWU. Both of those books are out on University of Washington Press. So I also want to talk a little bit about the stewards of uh, history and those are the archivists that do the work to preserve labor's legacy um, and the legacy of working people who formed unions. Um, this also might answer some of the questions that you have about why we're called the Anne Rand Library when you probably <laughs> saw that on that slide. I know a lot of people think that we're named after um, a conservative libertarian. We are not. That's Ayn Rand. Um, Anne Rand was actually kind of her opposite. She was known for her altruism. She was the, hired as the first professional librarian for the ILWU in 1946. And the union has maintained, other than a one small break, they have maintained a professional, professionally trained librarian on staff um, for this entire time. Anne was known for being a professional. Um, she was responsible for building what was at its time one of the best 
labor collections in the country. She helped people do research on the ILWU, and she even testified in Harry Bridges' defense in the Bridges-Robertson Schmidt trial um, in 1950. Uh, which is one of, I don't know if Bob is going to talk about that tonight, but it was one of many attempts to discredit ILWU leaders and part of an ongoing um, campaign to depart and discredit Harry Bridges in particular. So even though we have a library and the union provides staffing and resources to the library, we couldn't do what we do um, without, it, it's very much enhanced through relationships with other labor archivists. And so I kind of want to give a shout out to a few of them. One is Connor Casey. He is, I mentioned him because he's also an SFSU alum. He is now uh, director of the labor archives at the University of Washington. And he worked with Harvey and another historian, Dr. Ron Magden, to conduct uh, several dozen interviews with ILWU pensioners through a project with the Pacific Coast Pensioners Association. That project is ongoing as well. And then Lark, of course, I'm here. I can't say enough about you. I don't have enough time. <laughs> but you have been amazing stewards of so many great ILWU collections. Sean mentioned that Local 34's collection has a house, or has a home with the Labor Archives. Local 6, their uh, archives have a home there, as well as ILWU staff, union attorneys, and other movement leaders. Um, the labor archives have been invaluable to helping the ILWU preserve its historical legacy, including offering space, support, and other resources to make sure that these important records are preserved. Oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to flip this. This is Anne Rand. <laughs> Um, so, if you have any questions, this is our website, and my email is there, and I'm going to be here after the program, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. serving a third term as an elected executive officer of, on the SAG-AFTRA San Francisco Local Board, is the SAG-AFTRA delegate on the San Francisco Labor Council, and serves on various contract and negotiating committees for Actors' Equity Association. She's accompanied tonight by Tony Marcus. He's been a presence on the San Francisco Bay Area acoustic music scene for the last half century. From a start playing traditional folk music to the jazzier sounds of more recent years, such as Cheap Suit Serenaders, Cats and Jammers, and others, Tony has played guitar, violin, and other stringed instruments. Tony and Marie performed together in Fire on the Mountain, a play about the labor struggles of West Virginia coal miners for theater works at the Mountain View Performing Arts Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you. so much for having us tonight. We're, we're honored to be here. Uh, Tony and I are going to perform Song for Bridges. Uh, some call it the Ballad of Harry Bridges, and it was written and performed by the Almanac Singers. That's Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, uh, Lee Hayes, and Millard uh, Lampel. And um, Woody Guthrie sang it primarily, and they performed it uh, around the country to raise funds for uh, Harry's many legal troubles. <laughs> <laughs> Bridges was his name, an honest union leader who the bosses tried to frame. He left home in Australia to sail the seas around. He sailed across the ocean to land in Frisco town. There was only a company union, the bosses had their way. A worker had to stand in line. Dollar a day. When up 
Pipes for hairy bridges Us workers gotta get wise Our wives and kids will starve to death If we don't get organized Oh, the FBI is worried The bosses, they are scared They can't deport six million men they know And we're not gonna let them Send Harry or the sea We'll fight for Harry Bridges and build the CIO. They built a big bonfire around the Madsen lines that night. They threw their fink books in it and they said, We're gonna fight. We've got to get a living wage or gonna take a walk. They told it to the bosses, but the bosses wouldn't talk. They said there's only one way left to get that contract signed. So all around the waterfront they threw a picket line. They called it Bloody Thursday, the fifth day of July. A hundred men were wounded and two were left to die. Oh, the FBI is worried. The bosses, they are scared. They can't million men they know and we're not gonna let them send Harry or the sea we'll fight for Harry bridges and build the CIO Center and has served on the advisory board from its inception. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University, joined the history faculty at San Francisco State University in 1971, and became emeritus in 2012. 
He served at various times as chair of the history department, director of the labor studies program, chair of the academic senate, chair of the CSU academic senate, acting dean for behavioral and social sciences, and interim dean of undergraduate studies. <laughs> he is the author or co-author of 40-some published essays and seven monographs, co-editor of two anthologies, and co-author of college textbooks on U.S. and California history. He began working on a biography of my father, Harry Bridges, in 1985 at the invitation of Harry and Dickey Bridges, and spent the next 15 years doing archival research at more than 25 archives but university and other responsibilities delayed him from completing the book until after he retired. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Cherney. Well, thank you, Robbie. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, rendition of the song. Uh, my, in addition, we have three of Harry Bridges' granddaughters here. Why don't these are Robbie's daughters. And we have both of my granddaughters here. <laughs> the younger one was helping me with a PowerPoint that I did about Harry uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, when the when he started singing, um, she asked me, are you going to have that as part of your presentation tonight? And I said, no. <laughs> we had a real life. Um, Hold the mic a little closer. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Can I? <laughs> I lose my hearing aids. I take off my mask. I don't need to hear you. <laughs> um, for the generation of Americans who came of age during the 1930s, the name Harry Bridges was virtually synonymous with militant unionism and radical left-wing politics. He remained a prominent public figure uh, through the 1970s. Today, I'm going to give you a very fast overview of what I consider the major events in Bridges' life, and especially his major contributions to the ILWU. Then I'll present what I think of as his legacy, his approach to union leadership, which should be relevant for union members today, and his contributions to civil liberties, which are relevant for all of us. Bridges was born in 1901 in Australia. He was baptized as Alfred Renton Bridges. While a teenager, he began to call himself Harry after his favorite uncle, his father's brother, who advocated trade unionism and the socialism of the Australian Labor Party. He went to sea in 1917 at the age of 16 sailing at first between Melbourne and Tasmania, and later between Australia and New Zealand. In 1920, Bridges came to San Francisco, joined the Sailors' Union of the Pacific, and began to work in the U.S. coastal trade. In 1921, he participated in a nationwide seamen strike and briefly enjoyed joining the industrial workers of the world. He later said that the IWW had taught him the importance of solidarity among all workers, regardless of race, ethnicity, or religion. In 1922, he began to work on the San Francisco docks as a longshoreman. Dock work then was harsh and dangerous. Hiring was by the day or the job through the morning shape-up. There was no guarantee of continued employment, no benefits, just an hourly wage. A union of sorts called the Blue Book for the color of its dues book was undemocratic, undemocratic, corrupt, and exploitative. 
1933, the International Longshoremen's Association chartered Local 3879 in San Francisco. Bridges emerged as a leader among some two dozen longshoremen, including <laughs> some Communist Party members, who caucused at a hall on Albion Street. The Communist Party gave them an old mimeograph machine, which they used to run off the waterfront worker, which advocated militant action and opposed racial, ethnic, religious, or political discrimination within the union or on the job. The uh, ILWU archives has a complete set of these, and they are all digitized, and you can look at them online. When the union elected its first officers, Bridges and Henry Schmidt, two of the Albion Hall Caucus, won seats on the executive board. ILA locals from northern Washington to San Diego were part of the ILA's Pacific Coast District. Early in 1934, the district sought a coastwise contract. When waterfront employers refused, a coastwise longshore strike began. Several seafaring unions promptly struck with issues of their own. Much of the strike centered in San Francisco. These were the issues, issues for the longshoremen. And of these demands, the most important were union recognition, a coastwise contract with the same wages, hours, and conditions in every Pacific Coast port, and union hiring halls to replace the hated shakeup. These became the basis later for the ILWU. On May, day, on May 8, the day before the strike began, Bridges was elected chairman of his local strike committee. He had no opposition for the post. Bridges quickly became one of the most prominent figures in the strike, along with the other district leaders. On the afternoon of July 3rd, and again on July 5th, the Industrial Association of San Francisco, acting for the waterfront employers, tried to open up the port. You heard about it in the song. Using, uh, they opened the port using strike breakers under heavy police protection. Strikers resisted. On July 5th, San Francisco police killed two men and injured more than 100. Earlier, police had killed two strikers in Seattle and two in Los Angeles. Since then, among Pacific Coast Longshore workers, July 5th has been known as Bloody Thursday. The governor sent the National Guard to the San Francisco waterfront where they set up machine guns and patrolled the waterfront in tanks to protect the scabs. The San Francisco Labor Council voted a general strike. The general strike began on July 16th and lasted four days, shutting down much of the city uh, in a dramatic demonstration of so labor solidarity. During and shortly after the general strike, all parties agreed to arbitration by a board appointed by President Roosevelt. The longshoremen gained their most important demands especially a coastwise contract and hiring halls in each port with a dispatcher elected by union members. The strike propelled Bridges to the presidency of Local 3879 and then to the presidency of the Pacific Coast District. In mid-1937, the members of the Pacific Coast District voted overwhelmingly to join the Congress of Industrial Organizations becoming the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union. Bridges became its first president and CIO regional director. Time magazine put Bridges on its cover and called him the most conspicuous maritime labor leader in the U.S. today and also called him incorruptible. I'm jumping forward rather rapidly. In 1948, the ILWU faced a crisis. The Waterfront Employers Association wanted to regain control over hiring and had support in the Republican Congress, which had just passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which was aimed at restricting unions. Some provisions in that act were aimed directly at the ILWU's hiring halls. 
federal authorities use the Taft-Hartley Act to require that ILWU members vote on the employer's last offer. Not a single ballot was returned in one of the most impressive demonstrations of union solidarity in all U.S. labor history. Then came a bitter three-month strike during which the waterfront employers negotiators refused even to meet with Bridges because they accused him of being a communist. Eventually, some of the stockholders in the affected companies brought in a new negotiator and the two sides quickly came to an agreement. The irony was that the former negotiators had tried to get the ILWU to dump Bridges, but in the end, it was those negotiators who were given early retirements. <laughs> the successful negotiations of 1948 initiated a new look in longshore labor relations as the ILWU and the PMA, the new bargaining agent for the employers, negotiated a series of contracts that gave longshore workers job stability, paid vacations, a pension plan, and one of the first medical plans. By the late 1950s, Bridges, other ILWU officers, and many Longshore members were focused on a new, transformative, and potentially disruptive technology, containerization, the most important development in ocean shipping since the steam engine. The ILWU kept its members fully informed Here's a part of the newspaper of the very first container shipping from the Pacific Coast. Bridges argued that the ILWU should not fight change, but instead try to benefit from it. After extensive discussion in the union newspaper, in union meetings, and with endorsement by the membership, Bridges led negotiations through which the ILWU accepted full mechanization in return for generous retirement arrangements and a guarantee of full pay for those who did not retire even if there was no work. The ILWU PMA Modernization and Mechanization Agreement of 1960 led Secretary of Labor James P. Mitchell to judge that next only to John L. Lewis, Bridges has done the best job in American labor of coming to grips with the problems of automation. Bridges retired as ILWU president in 1977. And now I want to look at two aspects of Bridges' time as a union leader. First, the Supreme Court cases that set precedents for civil liberties. Then, Bridges' understanding of union leadership. Bridges' first Supreme Court case was Bridges versus California, which grew out of events in 1938 when Bridges was not yet a citizen. He had publicized a telegram that he sent to the Secretary of Labor about the likely consequence of a state, if a state judge ruled against the ILWU in the pending case. The judges found Bridges in contempt of court. Bridges appealed, eventually, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which decided in his favor by five to four, citing freedom of speech. The decision in Bridges versus California was only the second time the Supreme Court had invoked the 14th Amendment as limiting the ability of state governments to infringe on the liberties in the First Amendment. The decision did not mention Bridges' citizenship status, but a dissent noted that Bridges was not a citizen and thereby suggested that the majority opinion had the effect of conferring First Amendment rights on any person living in the United States regardless of citizenship. This decision was the second in a long series of Supreme Court decisions that prevented state and local governments from restricting First Amendment rights. Between 1939 and 1958, 55, sorry, Bridges was involved in four hearings or trials over his right to become and remain a U.S. citizen. They all revolved around the same central question, 
was Bridges a Communist Party member. Throughout his career as a labor leader, Bridges was open about being a Marxist, open about meeting with communists, open about his admiration for the Soviet Union. What was at issue in all four of these was whether the government could prove that Bridges was a party member. Had the government succeeded in any one of these cases, Bridges would have been denied citizenship or stripped of his citizenship and then been subject to either deportation or imprisonment or both. The first hearing officer in 1939 found for Bridges. Soon after, the House of Representatives voted by 330 to 42 for a bill that directed the Attorney General to arrest and deport Bridges, quote, notwithstanding any other provision of law, unquote. President Roosevelt knew this was unconstitutional but didn't want to have to veto it. So he sent Attorney General Robert Jackson to work out, uh, work with key senators in order to kill the bill in the Senate. At the same time, a new law, the Smith Act, changed the grounds for deportation from Communist Party membership to what was called affiliation, a change specifically designed for bridges. And Jackson ordered the FBI to investigate bridges. The FBI delivered a massive report. What happened here? Oh my. Let's see if we can do this. Well, we're back in business, I think. See if I can find where we are. I think we are about. Here. There yep, is. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's never happened to me. I've done it. <laughs> first time, uh, but we recovered. Okay, so the FBI delivered a massive report, more than 4,000 pages, uh, to Jackson in November of 1940. Jackson appointed Clarence N. Goodwin as a special assi assistant attorney general to review the FBI report. Goodwin was a constitutional law expert. He spent two months studying the FBI report, and you see here his conclusion. There is no direct evidence that the alien was ever a member of the Communist Party. Nonetheless, after a lengthy hearing, a new hearing officer found against Bridges, setting off a round of appeals and efforts to mobilize public opinion on Bridges' side. Song for Bridges, which you've just heard, was part of those efforts to mobilize public opinion. The FBI investigation of Bridges did not end when the hearing ended. FBI agents illegally tapped Bridges' phone and broke into the office of one of his lawyers and copied hundreds of documents about his case and other cases pending in federal courts. This is apparently the first known instance when the FBI did this to a lawyer with cases pending in federal courts. The Supreme Court finally heard the appeal in early April 1945. In the decision, the judges divided five to three with one recusal. It was a narrow decision likely to maintain their thin majority, but the conclusion was that Bridges had been ordered deported under a misconstruction of the term affiliation and by reason of an unfair hearing. However, the decision also confirmed that Bridges versus California had established that an alien has First Amendment rights of speech and press. Justice Frank Murphy concurred separately but went far beyond the narrow majority decision, stating, 
The record in this case will stand forever as a monument to man's inhumanity to man. Seldom, if ever, in the history of this nation has there been such a con concentrated and relentless crusade to deport an individual because he dared to exercise the freedom that belongs to him as a human being and that is guaranteed to him in the Constitution. And in his dissent, Murphy also concluded that the entire Smith Act was unconstitutional as punishing guilt by association. But that was a dissent in 1945. That constitutional issue had been raised by Bridges' attorneys. It was finally taken up by the Supreme Court only in 1957 in Yates versus U.S., which essentially ended Smith Act prosecutions. Bridges was neither a defendant nor a plaintiff in the third civil liberties case, but he was centrally involved. When campaigning for president in 1960, John F. Kennedy announced that what he called an effective attorney general could remove James Hoffa and Harry Bridges from their union offices. Once elected, Kennedy named his brother Robert as his attorney general. However, the Kennedy brothers did not try to remove Bridges. Instead, Robert Kennedy picked an easier target, Archie Brown, an open Communist Party member who had recently been elected to Local 10's executive board, a violation of Section 504 of the Landrum-Griffin Act, which prohibited Communist Party members from holding union office. Kennedy's Justice Department notified Bridges that Brown's election violated Section 504. Bridges responded, quote, the members of Local 10 had the right to elect anybody they damn well pleased, unquote. <laughs> Brown was arrested and indicted. Robert Kennedy told the press that Brown was the first to be charged under Section 504, presumably as a test case. Bridges and the other ILWU <coughs> officers directed the union's attorneys to represent Brown. They admitted that Brown was violating Section 04, but argued that Section 04 was violating freedom of association. Brown, or Bridges, was the first defense witness. He denounced Section 504 as meaning, quote, we could no longer operate as a democratic union we could no longer elect whom we wanted as officers, unquote. The judge, of course, found Brown guilty. He essentially admitted he was guilty. But on appeal, the full Ninth Court, uh, Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals, by a five to three vote, uh, agreed that Section 504 was unconstitutional. Kennedy's Justice Department then appealed that ruling, but the U.S. Supreme Court agreed and declared Section 504 unconstitutional as a bill of attainder. Asked for a comment, Bridges described the, Landrum, the entire Landrum-Griffin Act as, quote, one of the phoniest anti-labor laws slipped over on workers by such enemies of labor as Bobby Kennedy, unquote. Now I want to look at these four aspects of Bridges' approach to union leadership. Bridges was proud of the wages and working conditions that his union had won, but he also believed that a union needed to do more than just deliver good wages. I'm going to try to play for you his definition of what it meant to be the president of a left-wing union, and we'll see if it'll work.
So that's Bridge's definition of what it meant to be an officer of a left wing union. <coughs> In 1953, whoops. In 1953, Bridges and the other international officers presented the first version of what became the ILWU's 10 guiding principles, an extended definition of the, what the union was and still is all about. They are worth reading by any union member or anyone trying to organize a union. If there's one concept that covers all of these principles, it's the solidarity of labor and of working people all over the world, a concept that Bridges constantly preached and practiced. Bridges was very critical of what he called one-man unions. Throughout his presidency, he shared leadership with the elected vice president and the elected secretary treasurer. Within the Longshore Division, which he always headed, he shared leadership with the elected members of the Coast Labor Relations Committee. I came to think of Bridges as a combination of Marxist militant and pragmatic realist. His militancy was important in salvaging victory in 1934. He always said that it was important in bargaining to realize that the employer representatives were what he called the class enemy, even if they might be his personal friends. On the other hand, the M&M is a leading example of Bridges as a pragmatic realist. He once called it, and I'm quoting now, a beautiful piece of class collaboration. When Bridges died in 1990, one journalist observed, the fusion of leadership with the rank and file was Bridges' genius and his power, unquote. The Longshore Caucus was one way in which Bridges institutionalized this fusion of leadership and membership. Meetings of more than 100 elected delegates from every Longshore local to engage in freewheeling discussions of the contract their concerns, and their goals. The ILWU also institutionalized large negotiating committees with elected representatives from all the major longshore locals, and rarely, but nonetheless occasionally, with what were called fishbowl negotiations, where the entire longshore caucus could observe uh, the procedures and raise concerns separately with the negotiating committee. Bridges always insisted that any settlement had to be approved by a vote of the entire membership and, at times, by a supermajority. This was all part of what he referred to as a lot of rank-and-file democracy. Now, I should emphasize that these are my conclusions based on my research, but not everyone would agree, and perhaps not even Harry himself. He once said that college professors, people like me, are not qualified to write about labor history, and that anyone who writes real labor history must be, in his words, a working stiff. He further explained that a college professor is unable to understand, and I quote, quoting again, there's no two sides. There's only one side, our side. The boss is always wrong. You can't sell a college professor on that. <laughs> In 1985, the ILWU convention adopted a resolution by a unanimous standing vote and with long and sustained applause that called Bridges, quote, a living legend and an active symbol of what has always been great about the ILWU, an independent militant, rank-and-file democratic union, unquote. At about the same time, a national survey put only two San Franciscans on a list of the most prominent Americans of the 20th century. One was A.P. Giannini of the Bank of America, the other was Harry Bridges. Memorials 
and monuments to bridges continue to appear. I'll give you a minute. It's a long, long list. I'm not going to read it to you. Just take my word for it. <laughs> but the most obvious monument to bridges is the ILWU itself, which continues to stand on the left of the U.S. labor movement and continues to be highly democratic. And do we have time if people want to ask questions or make comments? Yeah, I think we have a few we minutes. Do. Sure, I'm happy to take any questions. FBI's report on it was not made public, uh, and it kept coming up in HUAC meetings for years and years and years. Anytime Harry's name came up, they produced the forged card. Uh, I did do research. I spent several months in Moscow uh, going through an archive there that holds the records of the U.S. Communist Party. Uh, and my conclusion was that Bridges' relation to the Communist Party was sometimes rather ambiguous. But what was absolutely clear in all of those records was that nobody from the party ever gave him an order. They sometimes gave him a request. <laughs> and sometimes he did, and more often he just did what he thought was best for his union. I saw someone over here with a question. Could you speak a little bit about uh, the FBI and Dave Hoover, how, how he was involved? Yeah, well, Hoover, of course, was very personally involved in the Bridges case from the beginning. Uh, at the point at which uh, the FBI was given this, this charge in, in 1941. Um, Hoover liked to really bask in the publicity he got from being personally involved uh, in, in big headline cases. So he personally flew out to San Francisco to announce that he was taking charge, big splash in the newspapers, and then he went back to Washington and turned it all over to one of his assistants. Um, <laughs> But, but he followed it all very carefully. You know, all through Bridges' FBI file, you'll come across little notes scribbled in the margin by, by Hoover. He was watching it all very carefully. And on one occasion, uh, uh, shortly after that, that first decision, while it was all, or the second decision while it was being appealed, Bridges was in New York for, for a fairly long period of time uh, holding various kinds of meetings with his defense committee and, and other CIO uh, organizations. And the FBI bugged his hotel room. And he found the bug. But instead of just uh, disconnecting it, uh, he uh, took a hotel room directly across the street where he could look into the hotel room that the FBI had. They had the hotel room next to him, the manager who said, oh, we have to turn this back over to the people um, and, and one final comment about all that. It was written up in the New Yorker. It was called Some Fun with the FBI. <laughs> and Hoover was furious. Uh, someone later said that, Brit that Hoover never got over his anger about having been held up to ridicule because when that story hit, Hoover met with Roosevelt, and Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, just kind of laughed at him and said, well, well, John, you got caught with your pants down this time. <laughs> Don't get your panties in a knot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Hoover, it was also said that there were many agents 
who rose or fell based upon the Bridges case mm -hmm. because Hoover was so directly connected to it. Yeah, question in the back. Can you uh, discuss uh, Bridges' leadership and legacy around fair employment, opening up the union to black workers and other workers of color? Yes, you know, I, I, I do look at all of that in the book. Uh, from the very beginning, Bridges argued that there could be no discrimination on the job or in the union. And during the 1934 strike, uh, there was a sustained effort, especially by Bridges, to bring this message to the black community in the Bay Area. Because in the previous big longshore strike in 1919, uh, blacks had been used as strike breakers. And that was a strategy that employers used at the time. If you go on strike, we're going to turn your job over. And they didn't use polite language, right? Um, there were a very small number of black gangs on the waterfront, but they were segregated, segregated black gangs. One of the things that Bridges and his, his uh, associates in the Albion Hall Caucus did, as soon as they were on the executive board, uh, and, and as soon as Bridges was president, was to make sure that there would be no more segregation of work gangs on the San Francisco waterfront. Uh, and throughout his <coughs> career, Bridges worked also to bring black members into leadership. Uh, and it was partly through his doing that the first of the international, first black international officer uh, became a vice president. So Bridges uh, was committed to racial equality throughout his entire time, uh, and, and he worked very hard to make sure that the union was open without any kind of racial, religious, political discrimination. Thank you. All the way in the back. Uh, <laughs> was not paid any more than the highest paid worker in the union? Yeah, throughout his time as, as international president, he insisted that his pay be no higher than that of the best paid longshore worker. Um, and at that time, I don't know if this is still true, but at that time, the president's pay was set by the, by the uh, annual convention or the, the international convention when it became biannual and later triennial. I don't know how the president's pay is set now. But it was always a subject for discussion because there would be efforts to give him more money and he would insist that he not be paid any more than the best paid longshore worker. People pointed out, you know, there are walking bosses who make more than that, but he, he uh, simply refused. Uh, here, and, and then I'll take over here. Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of relationship, uh, if any, did uh, he have with the other uh, leadership of the uh, other CIO unions, uh, uh, Murray, Ruther, uh, Thomas? Um, it became very strange. Um, especially in the uh, after World War II, uh, during the McCarthy era, um, the, the leadership of the CIO became anti-communist. Uh, Bridges kept his own politics, uh, and relations were very strained. However, that 1948 strike came at a time when Bridges' relations with the CIO leadership were probably as strained as they had ever been. And that's probably one of the reasons why the Waterfront Employers Association thought now's the time. Now's the time. We're going to get the union to dump Bridges, and the CIO isn't going to come to his assistance. Uh, they were absolutely wrong, because the CIO was there and fully supportive of the strike sat at the bargaining table with Bridges, uh, demonstrated their, their full commitment to him and to the union. Uh, and then shortly after that, they expelled the ILWU, <laughs> as you probably are well aware. There was a hand over here. Yeah, maybe one more. Hi, uh, uh, I'm a former student of Bob's, and I, and I followed Bob to Moscow, in fact, uh, where he gave me some assistance for my own research into uh, Communist Party archives, which was all of my, uh, much of all my dissertation. I just want to say one or two more words about uh, Harry Bridges. 
Now, the tri criterion for Communist Party membership, set by Lenin in the year 1902, uh, was that to be a member of the Communist Party, you had to be a member of an organization, follow its discipline. And I think later they had the idea that you also had, uh, had to pay dues. Uh, well, he certainly, uh, Bridges certainly never did any one of these things. And I believe there's a quote from Bridges, which Bob may be confirmed, that supposedly he said at one point that I don't call the, uh, uh, the Communist Party doesn't tell me what to do, I tell them what to do. And, uh, and in fact, I believe he did sit in on you know, some uh, high-level Communist Party meetings where he told them what to do, uh, but, not, but not, did not necessarily uh, do what they told him, is my understanding. Uh, I, it's basically right, John. I, I did not come across that exact quotation, but I say something pretty much like that myself in the book. That uh, there are times when Bridges took positions that were contrary to the position of the Communist Party, and that sometimes, reasonably soon afterwards, they changed their mind and followed his lead rather than him uh, following what the party uh, line of the moment was. Um, yeah, I. I Except that I never found that quotation. You're right, John. Great. It's always good to see my former students here. <laughs> John may be the only one. Usually, there's more in these gatherings. Okay, Who's we're that? gonna we're gonna wrap Joe it up. Joe Oh, Joe. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Joe had a question. All the way in the back. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Question, go ahead. Oh, I just do too. Oh. oh. Other old students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two, two uh, students. Two English. Oh. <laughs> you know, you, you begin to feel old when you discover <laughs> that some of your former students are retiring. <laughs> okay. yeah. Maybe you can talk about his uh, fight uh, to defend Japanese Americans and his wife. Who was Japanese. Yeah. Um, in case you didn't hear the question, it was, you know, what was his position at the time of the Japanese uh, so-called relocation, the, in, the incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, in, in, the, in 1942. Um, there was a meeting of the international officers, and they decided that uh, Bridges at the time uh, was in all kinds of legal jeopardy. You, you saw all of those trials. And so they decided that Lou Goldblatt would be the one to make this statement on behalf, not only of the ILWU, but the California CIO. And the statement was that this is wrong, that this is being conducted, this, this is a decision being made in a moment of hysteria, and it will be uh, marked that way in history, and uh, you shouldn't do it. And throughout uh, the war, the uh, ILWU dispatcher consistently had articles about Japanese Americans uh, who were uh, supporting the war effort, who you know who were in the army, uh, who were engaged in, in various kinds of war work. And at the end of that war, uh, after the Japanese uh, were released from the camps and began returning to work, uh, the ILWU made a point of being open to them as members. There is a famous case which Harvey has written. Is, where's Harvey Schwartz? There you are. Which Harvey has written about in Stockton, um, a, a part of Local 6, one of the, a, a warehouse unit in Stockton, had barred a Japanese American from membership. And Harry and uh, the head of Local 6 went to Stockton and ripped their charter off the wall and required that every member of that local had to sign a statement pledging that they were opposed to any such racial discrimination and refusal to sign meant that you were out of the union. Wow. Read Harvey's article about it. He has a lot more information than I have in my book. Bob, do you want to tell people that your book is for sale with Green Arcade? Yeah. There's, are there any copies left back there? <laughs> the answer is five. Uh, I'm happy to sign. If some of you bought one and didn't get me my signature, uh, I'll hang around and I'll sign as many as you want to have signed. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.